So good morning everyone. Um, today we have an one, an one hour lecture in the morning and we're going to talk about uh, model management. Uh, predominantly with, uh, with Epsilon, but I'm also going to refer to some other technologies that uh, one could use instead. So yesterday we talked about designing uh, domain-specific meta-models and creating models that conform to them using tools in the Eclipse modeling framework ecosystem. And in particular, we looked at Emphatic for creating meta-models and at the EMF reflective tree-based editor and the FlexMI textual syntax for creating models that conform to them. At the end of the day, Hrishikesh very reasonably asked, right, what do we do now with these, uh, with these models? And indeed, creating meta-models and models is not the end of the story, it's really where the fun begins. So, uh, meta-modeling and modeling represent the left-hand side of the graphic here at the bottom. Um, this is where we construct that little house, um, that little model house. Model management is the process of constructing the machinery on the right-hand side, over here, which can take the little house as input and then blows it up into the actual thing, right? Into an actual building that, that one can live in. So to build such machinery for models, we need to be able to query models and extract information of interest. We need to be able to identify errors and inconsistencies in our models so that these are reported very early, not when we've actually generated the house. Um, and then, of course, to transform our models into textual artifacts, that could be code, documentation, configuration scripts, as well as other models in case of complex, uh, of complex uh, chains. Then in a collaborative setting, we're also interested in being able to compare and merge our models um, and so on and so forth. And we call the sum of these activities uh, model management activities. So in this lecture, I'm going to introduce Epsilon, which is a family of languages for programmatic model management. In particular, we're going to focus on three languages of the platform. You will see that Epsilon has uh, seven or eight different languages. We're only going to focus on three just because we only have one hour. And we're going to start with EOL, which is the core expression language of Epsilon. And then I will briefly present the model validation and the model to text transformation languages of the platform, um, which are uh, EVL and EGL respectively. Um, of course, in this one hour introduction, we will only manage to scratch the surface of these languages and additional reading is required uh, in your own time to be able to put them to, to work. It's unlikely that you would learn any programming language in, uh, in one hour, let alone three. Uh, fortunately, there's plenty of documentation about all three of these languages on the Epsilon website and in the Epsilon book. And I have included some more specific references at the end of uh, uh, the discussion of each language within this deck of slides. Okay, let's start with the core language of Epsilon, uh, EOL, that we can use to query and modify models. So EOL is an imperative uh, language. It's dynamically typed, so you shouldn't expect to find features such as code completion. Um, its syntax has been influenced by two different worlds, so by the Java, JavaScript world, but also by the OCL world. OCL is a standard constraint language. Um, standardized by the object management group and it offers quite convenient features for uh, navigating collections for example that we have uh, inherited and we have adopted in uh, in EOL. Uh, EOL can be used both as a standalone language to query and modify your models but its primary aim is to serve as an embedded expression language for uh, task specific languages such as EVL for model validation and EGL for model to text transformation. So here you can see how uh, EOL is the, the foundation of the, uh, of the Epsilon family of languages. And then we have a number of languages sitting on top of it, which reuse EOL as their core expression language, but they add uh, um, new syntax specific to the requirements of these, of these different tasks. And today we're going to look at uh, EVL, the validation language, and EGL. Okay, so we're going to stick to the example from, from yesterday where we have our components meta model. 
um, and a model that conforms to it. So just a reminder, we have applications containing components, components contain ports, and then we have connectors connecting ports together. And this is a model that conforms to, to this meta model over here. So um, let's talk about types in EOL. Uh, this is a small, uh, small EOL program down here. Um, EOL provides some built-in types, um, primitives that you would expect, like a string, an integer, and boolean, and real. It provides four types of uh, built-in collections, sequence, bag, set, and ordered set. And the way these collections are different to each other is based on whether they are ordered and unique. So a sequence is, a unique, is an ordered collection that is not unique, so it accepts duplicates. A bag is neither ordered non -un nor unique. A set is unique, but it doesn't guarantee order. And then an ordered set is both unique, so it doesn't allow duplicates and it's uh, ordered. Then there is a map uh, type, which is uh, very similar to HashMap in Java or to dictionary in, in other languages. But then more importantly, all the types in the meta models of the, of the models um, queried in an EOL program become types uh, of the language. So here you can see how uh, we define a new uh, sequence called ports. So this is an, an ordered but not unique collection. And then we assign that to port.all. This is all instances of port. So by configuring this program to run against instances of this meta model, all the types here, all these four types become valid types in, in EOL. Uh, we can use the dot all uh, property on types to return all instances anywhere in the model. So if I do a port.all, that would return all the ports of the application and all the ports of all the components in the application, regardless of where in the structure of the model they live. And also um, in EOL, references and attributes of types become navigable as properties. So um, here we have this, uh, this collection of all ports. We can iterate through them using a for loop. And then we can create another variable called port name of type string. And then we can get the name of the port. So port.name is valid because the port type in our meta model has a name, uh, a name attribute, right? In the same way, we could access port.incoming and get all the connectors that go towards that port or port.type and get the type of the port and so on and so forth. And then we print um, the, uh, the port name using EOL's built-in uh, println function. Uh, I'm just giving you a quick overview of some of the core features of EOL. As I said, this is not an exhaustive uh, uh, kind of tutorial on, on the language. So one of the things that we need to do very commonly uh, in the model management programs is to iterate collections. So for example, when we're querying a model, we may be interested to find uh, all ports of type booleans, or we may want to collect all the names of, of all our components, or we may want to find, uh, um, for instance, um, uh, ports that have no type, that where we forgot to, to add the type, or ports that are not connected to anything else in the model, or maybe connectors that are just connected to one port, they only have a source or a target, but not, but not both. Um, and this usually requires some sort of looping uh, construct. We could do this using for loops, but uh, for loops can get quite, uh, quite verbose. So EOL supports first order logic operations uh, by default. Um, and these are filtering operations such as select or uh, collection operations such as collect. So if we wanted, for example, to find all ports of Boolean type in our model, we could uh, we would call port.all to get us back all the ports and then the select method in the select method we could select those ports the type of which is boolean and that would return a filtered collection return uh, containing all only these ports 
Now, if we wanted to collect the names of all components into a sequence, uh, we do the same. So component.all will return all instances of components, so both components in this, uh, in this sample model that we're working with. And then um, collect would collect the name of each component, so that would return a sequence of strings, a collection of, uh, of strings. All of these operations are documented in the Epsilon book. There is a link further in the, in the presentation. Um, so you can, uh, you can see what's available. You can find what, which, uh, which of these operations meet, uh, meet your needs. Now, in EOL, uh, primitive types and built-in types in general come with some predefined operations. So, for example, EOL strings are really Java strings. So, any method you can call on a Java string, you can call on an EOL string. Uh, plus, uh, EOL provides some additional convenience operations such as first to uppercase, first to lowercase, uh, pad, um, things that we've found to be very common when writing programs, commonly required when writing programs on models. Um, the same goes with integer. So uh, an, an EOL integer is a Java integer and you can call any method you can call on a Java integer plus some convenience methods that we have imported from uh, maths.util um, to compute, for example, uh, the, the logarithm or the absolute value of an, of an integer. Uh, what's more interesting is that EOL enables the extension of all existing types, both model element types and primitive types, with additional operations. And there are several languages out there that, that provide similar support. So what we have here, for example, is a, a new operation that we define in the context of, of the type port. And it's called get label, and it returns a string. And uh, uh, in the body of this operation, again, this is EOL. Uh, we return the name of the port, then a colon, and then uh, the type of the port. And in this way, we really attach this uh, operation to the type port. It's as if this operation was defined within the type itself. So that then in our program, we can get hold of, say, the first port in our model and then call the get label method that we define down here uh, on it and then print, uh, print the result. Um, EOL supports contextless operations as well. So we could omit port here and, and then we wouldn't be able to call this on, a, on an existing object. We would just call this as a kind of freestanding operation. Um, and also it has optional, uh, optional return types. Of course, we could have uh, parameters in here uh, as well. Um, beyond querying models, EOL programs can also modify model elements and, uh, and create and delete them. So um, as you would expect from an imperative uh, programming language, there is uh, an assignment operation. So what we do here is we create a new component in our model, we create a new port in our model, and then we set the name of that port to temperature, and then we add that port to the ports of our component. So if you see a uh, component has a, a reference called, right, okay, so this code is wrong because our component class doesn't have a, a, uh, doesn't have a reference called ports, it has a reference called imports and a reference called outports. And this is why you should always run your code before you put it on slides. So just fix that. So let's add this to the imports of, uh, of the component. Okay, and then eventually we uh, we delete uh, we delete our component the component that we created. Now there is a uh, there are two interesting things to mention here. So when we create a component and when we create a port, uh, unless we put them somewhere else in the in the structure of our model, say under the application, unless we put the component under an existing application, or unless we put the port 
under an existing component, all of these will appear as top level elements in our model. So they will just float at the, at the top of our model. When we, when we call c.imports.addp, then p goes under the component because uh, imports and outports are containment references. For the same reason, here when we delete c, this new port is deleted as well because it now lives under a containment reference of, uh, of C. And this is the semantics of containment that we discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, okay, so as with uh, most uh, programming languages, EOL provides a way to fall back to its kind of mother language, which is, uh, which is Java. So um, if you're using EOL to query your, your model and you find that you need to do something that the language doesn't support or doesn't support in a, in a nice way, you can always fall back to, to Java. You can instantiate native Java uh, classes and then call their methods and uh, access their properties and so on and so forth. So what this little piece of code does is it creates a new JFrame, which is a UI class in, in Java. It sets its bounds and then it sets its title and it uh, sets its visibility to true. And what happens is you get this uh, native Java window to, to pop up when you run this, uh, this little program. So you can always fall back to Java uh, if you find that, that uh, um, there's something that you want to do there for which there already exists, for example, a good library um, or uh, it's just preferable to, to, to do this in Java. Okay, so this was the, my very, very quick introduction to, to EOL. I think I'll now switch to Eclipse and give you a very small demo of how, how EOL works with models in practice. Um, Okay, so what I have here is a project that contains the, the meta model we have been discussing so far. Right? So this is our, uh, this is our application meta model. Let me just put that over here. Like that right this is our application meta model and then I also have a, a Fleximi for our boiler controller okay and here you can see the actual graphical representation of uh, of this model so what I have here is an EOL program uh, that contains this first uh, first fragment that I that I showed you where we, uh, we define a ports variable, we assign it to all instances of port uh, and then we iterate through all the ports and we get hold of the name of every port and we print it, right? Now, if you look at this program, there's nothing that links this program to the actual model or meta model. It just magically refers to ports and so on and so forth. So what we can do if we uh, if we want to run this program is in the standard Eclipse way we need to go to run configurations we need to create a new config run configuration for our program you will see that it picks up the path of the uh, active uh, uh, of the active editor so because I just opened comps.tol it will pick this up as the um, the file that uh, that I want to run. We could always change that. There's a browse button here. And here's where we need to configure the models against which uh, this program will run. So I will click add. I will select that I want to run this uh, against an EMF model. And here you can see how Epsilon is not limited to EMF models, but it supports a kind of wide range of models, including Simulink, for example, models, um, including uh, spreadsheets, 
including Google spreadsheets, uh, XML documents, and so on and so forth. So for this demo, I'll go with just an EMF model. Um, because Epsilon programs can run on multiple models, uh, every model needs to have a unique local name. I will just call this M because we only have one model, so it doesn't really matter. And I will select my model file, which is the boiler controller, FlexMI. And you can see that when I've selected my model file, its meta model URI has been picked up uh, automatically. So here I have two options. Uh, one is whether to read this model from disk when, uh, uh, when I start my program. The other one is when, whether to save any changes I, I may make to it in my program in the disk. I will untick this box because I don't plan to make any changes um, using these queries. And if I make any changes, uh, I don't want them to be accidentally uh, saved back to disk. Okay. So that's everything I need. I've now configured the model that will run against this program. So if I run this, I can see the names of all the ports in the, in the model here, right? Okay, so here I could say, well, I'm not, I don't want all the ports. I just want the ports. Um, the name of which starts with the letter T. And I don't need to set up my run configuration again. That's already set up. I just need to run my program again. And you can see how I'm only getting uh, the temperatures, the, the, the temperature related variables. Um, and just to demonstrate operations as well. So here I have an operation in the context of port uh, called get label, which returns a string. And I want to say that this returns self.name and self.type. And here, instead of getting the port name, I'll just get port get label and um, so this is not a real code completion right this will just give you uh, this will just list uh, all the tokens and functions defined in the program it doesn't really know if the at this stage if the, the operation can be invoked on this particular element this is mainly for convenience we have another strand of work where we're working on on static analysis for EOL but it's not mature enough to, to include in the main epsilon distribution at this stage. So if I was to run this again, we can see how we now get the label of every um, of every port. Any questions so far? I'm looking at the chat. Okay, uh, then let's move on. I have put a copy of all of this source code, the source code of all these three projects uh, on, on Schoology uh, because in the afternoon I will ask you to extend some of the programs, some of the Epsilon programs um, uh, in, this, uh, in these projects with a little bit more functionality just to get some hands-on um, uh, feel of, uh, of Epsilon and its development tools. Right, so back to the slides. Um, I have put some links here. Uh, the Epsilon book is a 280 something pages uh, book uh, that contains comprehensive documentation for all the languages in Epsilon. So in case of uh, any questions on what operations are, are supported on strings or on collections or uh, how do I do this or that, that should be your first point of, uh, of reference. Um, and there's also a section on the, on the Eclipse website where we list a number of articles related to different languages that kind of uh, either provide a little bit more detail or they document new features of the, of the platform that have not made it into the book yet. So we saw how we can uh, query models using EOL. Now we're going to move on to uh, model validation. 
In terms of the Epsilon architecture, we are now up here. So we talked about EOL, we are now going to talk about EVL, which is the model validation language which sits on top of, uh, on top of EOL. So why do we need uh, additional validation? Um, a meta model itself can express well-formedness rules for, for models conforming to it. For example, uh, in our model here, we can only have instances of application, component, port and connector, because these are the four types provided by our meta model. If we wanted to be able to model users here or requirements, there's no way to do that. We are constrained by the, by the meta model, which is a good thing. Um, the meta model also expresses some structural constraints, cardinalities, for example. So uh, every component can have exactly one output port. If we look at the cardinality of this method, if we try to create an, a, con a component with two output ports, uh, that would violate this constraint. So our model wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be valid as far as EMF is, uh, is concerned. So we can define such structural constraints in the meta model itself. For instance, we cannot connect two connectors uh, because there's no relationship, there's no reference like that in our meta model. We can only connect uh, connectors to, uh, to ports. But then there are some uh, rules that we may want to be able to specify, but the meta model itself doesn't support them. So, for example, um, in order for our generated code to look good, we might want to enforce that component names should start with an uppercase letter, so that if this T was a lowercase T, we would get some sort of warning that says, oh, you, know, you need to fix this, otherwise your generated code won't look nice. Or, for instance, uh, in a more serious constraint, since um, connectors represent communication between ports, we might want to enforce that the ports connected by a connector must have the same type, um, so that we don't try to uh, pass uh, in a port that expects an integer, we don't pass a boolean or the other way around. Uh, or for instance, we might want to ensure that all, uh, all the ports of all our components in the application are connected to something else, so we haven't forgotten to connect uh, any, any ports. And this is the sort of constraints that eCore and metamodeling languages themselves cannot really uh, express. They're too, too, too expressive for, uh, for these constraints. So for such constraints, we need a more expressive validation language. Um, in the context of Epsilon, this comes in the form of uh, EVL, which is a language that builds on top of EOL. So it reuses all of its syntax and then it provides validation specific syntactic uh, sugar. In EVL, validation rules are expressed as invariants and we have two types of invariants. We have constraints that produce errors when they are violated and we have critiques that are kind of softer constraints that produce warnings. And then invariants are grouped by model element type. So in EVL, every invariant consists of uh, uh, four parts. Uh, most of them are optional. So the most important part is the check uh, block, which uh, specifies the condition that needs to be satisfied by the checked element. And in the context of this constraint, where we want to check that the source and the target ports of every connector, the types of the source and target ports of every connector match, is this EOL expression over here. So self is like this in Java. It refers to the, uh, to the model element that is currently being checked. We know that this is of type connector. So here we start with a definition of uh, uh, the types of, of the type of model elements that the contained constraints will check. Um, here we have the name of this constraint. So we have a type ma types match constraint that applies to uh, elements of type connector. And the check condition states that the type of the source of the connector needs to be the same as the type of the target of the, of the connector. And again, here we are navigating uh, properties defined in the meta model. Now, if this is not the case, uh, if, we, if we have a, a connector that connects ports of incompatible types, we need to provide a sensible error message to the user. And this is what the message part of the constraint does. It constructs a string uh, from static text and from information in the model that informs the user about what's, what's going wrong. 
um, because we cannot really expect users to be able to read these constraints and to work out why they've been violated. Now, constraints in EVL also have, can also have a guard that limits their applicability to a particular sub, subsets of, uh, of, these, uh, of these elements. So here, for example, it doesn't make sense to check this constraint at all uh, if, uh, the, uh, if the source of the constraint, uh, if the source of the connector is undefined or if the target of the, of the connector is undefined. So we need to have a fully connected connector first before we can actually uh, check that types, uh, that types match. Okay, that was a very quick introduction to EVL. Um, again, it, there's much more to the language that, than what I've managed to, to present here. But just go quickly back to Eclipse to see how we can run EVL constraints against programs and against models and what we get as, uh, as output. Okay, so if we look at the validation folder, there's a comps.evl. Um, I'll just get rid of this for now. There's a, there's a comps.evl file that contains uh, constraints. And this is the constraint that I just, uh, that I just demonstrated. So um, this is its guard, its check part, and its message. And I have a few more constraints here. So I have a constraint for the type component and uh, that checks that uh, uh, every component has at least one port. And I have another constraint that checks that uh, um, every component has uh, exactly one uh, out port. And then I have a critique uh, that states that the name of components should start with an uppercase letter. Right? And then I have a constraint for port, which states, uh, well, it's a critique, so it produces a warning if it's violated, that the name of a port should start with a lowercase uh, letter. And this is the condition. So how do I run this against my, uh, against my model? Same way as I did with, uh, with EOL. So I'll go to run configurations. I will select uh, EVL validation, create a new run configuration. This picks up the, um, the EVL file that is in the active editor. And then I'll go to models. Again, same drill, add an EMF model, give it a name, select my model. I don't want to make, to save any changes I might make accidentally. Okay, run. And what I get back on this occasion is nothing because there's nothing wrong with my model. So now in order to break a constraint and demonstrate uh, EVL's, uh, um, EVL's functionality, I'm going to go to my model and uh, if we look at this, uh, if we look at our example again, we have the temperature port of the application, which is this one going to the temperature port of the temperature controller, which is this one. And if we look at their types now, both of them are integers. So if I wanted to make my constraint, this constraint fail, I would go here and change that to say a Boolean. Okay, so now if I run my EVL constraints, I will get this error message here saying that ports Temperature and temperature cannot be connected because they have uh, they have different types. That's fine. Uh, I can clear this. I will go back and fix it at some point. So then I can add a component and I'll give it the name foo. And now if I run my constraints again, this will complain uh, even more because there are several things that are wrong with foo. Its name doesn't start with an uppercase letter. This is a critic and that's why I'm getting this little yellow icon here, which is a warning. But more importantly, foo has no input ports and it has no output port, right? And what we can also do with, uh, 
what we can also do with uh, EVL is we can define fixes because it builds on, EV on EOL so it has uh, the ability to uh, also auto fix to, to modify models. So if I go to component here we have our constraint that checks that um, the, the name of the component starts with an uppercase letter and we can produce a message but we can go even further and say well I'm also going to define a fix and the title is going to be renamed to self.name.first to uppercase okay and then there's a do part where we can do self.name equals self.name.first to upper case okay so if I uh, was to run this then I can right click here and I can see uh, this quick fix and it's renamed to foo and now this is marked as uh, as fixed uh, of course the caveat is that FlexMMI is a read-only format um, so my change won't be saved back to the model, but if I was to use a uh, if I was to use a like a regular EMF model, I could make the change and then persist it back to uh, back to my model. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Then let's move on to uh, the last language for today okay do you need to change the read only yes you would need to change the read only but even in this case uh, changes made to flex my models because it uses a fuzzy parsing algorithm are not are not saved back to back to disk right so we'd need to use an xmi backed model uh, if we wanted to save uh, to save changes All right. Okay, so we've poked our model. Um, we have uh, we have specified some additional validation constraints to to kind of verify that it's uh, it's in good shape. It doesn't omit any information. It doesn't uh, contain any internal inconsistencies, and so on and so forth. The next task and the final task of this uh, of this workflow will be to actually transform our model into code because at the end of the day we want to uh, to deliver software right models are only just a medium for achieving our ultimate aim which is to develop high quality software. Um, we're going to use uh, another language from Epsilon called uh, EGL, Epsilon Generation Language, which is somewhere here in the overall architecture. Unsurprisingly, it extends uh, EOL as well, so we can use everything we know about EOL so far. And what we will want to do in this step is we want to transform uh, component models into source code, and in particular into Java source code. So every component will be transformed into a Java class that has an execute method. Input ports of the component will become uh, parameters of this method. Output ports will determine the return type of the method. And then we, will all, we also want to generate an extra Java class for the entire application that wires up all the components of the application and manages kind of passing inputs to outputs and so on and so forth. So more concretely, from our uh, temperature controller component here, we want to generate a class called temperature controller. And since this um, component has two ports, temperature and target temperature, its execute method should have two parameters with the equivalent uh, names and types. And since, temperate, and since it returns an integer, this method should return uh, an integer. So, of course, here we're missing an important bit, which is the implementation of the method. So, what does this, this method actually do? This is something that we don't wish to model, right? 
it's fine for a for the developer to go into the body of that method and add the add the functionality right we we accept this on this uh, on this occasion now if we look at the class that we want to produce from boiler actuator it's very similar so it's a component um, uh, that has two uh, uh, input ports that should become parameters of the execute uh, method and then it has an output port of type uh, integer which will dictate the return type of this uh, of this execute function now things get a little bit, bit more interesting in the expected output for the whole system for the whole application so this is where um, again we have an execute method for the boiler controller class boiler controller is the name of our entire application our entire application has three ports temperature target temperature and boiler status which becomes uh, which become parameters of the of the execute function and it returns an integer so in here we have used the knowledge uh, in the model or the, the setup of the connectors and which ports they connect in order to create automatically the code that wires up all these components. So developers don't really have to write that code. We can write a generator that writes this sort of code once and then regardless of how big and how complicated uh, your component model is, all this tedious wiring up code is automatically generated uh, for you right so this is the main reason why we built this language why we built this component language uh, in the first place because we wanted to make sure that all the code that for very complex component models this code can get quite complex trying to work out which is the correct order in which to run components uh, in order to produce an output before it's needed by another component all this tedious uh, work can be automated in the context of a code generator okay um, so how do we write such a such a model to text transformation that produces this code from our models and uh, there are several languages out there uh, we're going to focus on EGL which is a template based model to text transformation language if you have used languages such as PHP or ASP or JSP in the past uh, EGL will be very familiar. Of course, it uses EOL as an expression language. Um, and importantly, I think one of the main differences of EGL compared to web-based uh, web-based template languages is that it supports preservation of handwritten code so that we can mix generated and handwritten code um, and, they, and when we regenerate, our handwritten code doesn't get overridden. We'll talk a little bit about this in the next few slides. So EGL really contains two sub-languages, uh, one for uh, coordinating templates and the other for transforming elements into files. So the first sub-language um, is called EGX. It's the, the coordination language of, uh, of EGL. So what we have here is the coordination, is the third part, first part of uh, the coordination uh, program for our small code generator and here we can see a rule called application to class uh, that specifies that it applies to elements of type uh, application so we only have one application in our model so this rule will only be uh, executed once um, and then it transforms every application into a java file that it puts in this uh, location, in this relative location, on, on disk using this EGL template and passing these parameters um, to it. So this rule is going to be executed uh, once for the one application we have in our model. Now we have a second rule in the same file uh, that applies to components, so this will be executed twice because we have Two components in our model and it runs a different template component to class.egl and it stores it specifies where to actually store um, the output and what parameters to pass uh, to pass to it now let's look at 
this one at component to class dot EGL, the template that we want to run for every uh, component in our model. So um, this is how EGL, how the templating language looks like. Uh, what appears in blue text is static text that the generator will emit uh, as is. And what appears in these delimiters, in these square brackets, percentage delimiters, are EOL expressions that will um, contribute information coming from the model. So uh, remember that when we run this, uh, this template, it has access to two variables, uh, C, which is the component for which we run it, and also a package variable uh, that, we have passed, uh, that we have passed to it. So this template uh, starts by emitting the word package followed by the actual package name that we have passed to it through uh, the through EGX. Then in the second line it prints the static text public class followed by the name of the component. And then it tries to construct the execute method. So it starts with the keyword public. It prints the type of the output of the component and then it prints the word execute and then it prints the parameters of, uh, uh, of that component. And if we look at the getParameters method, all it does is it collects the input ports of the component. It then collects strings containing their type and their name, and it separates these using commas. And now what's interesting here, we have two commands that will actually create the scaffolding uh, where we can go in and contribute the functionality, the implementation of our method. Because remember, these methods will be generated with an empty body uh, by default. So when we run our transformation, what we'll get uh, for our boiler actuator component is uh, these four lines of, of text, and then nothing here, and then these three lines of text. And here you can notice these, uh, that these comments that say protected regions execute on begin, protected region execute end. These have been generated from these two special uh, commands. And these comments will be recognized the next time our generator is executed uh, and will preserve whatever is between them. So we can safely go in here and add um, or some, some additional code to specify the behavior of, of this method. And if later on we decide to add the third port, for example, to our boiler or to rename one of, these, uh, one of these ports or whatever, and we rerun our generator, we can be confident that this code will be preserved. This handwritten code will be uh, preserved. Okay, let's go back to Eclipse and see how that all works. <coughs> okay, let's have a look at our transformation, at our model to text transformation, which lives under this M2T folder. Um, so this is our EGX. This is, is uh, the template coordination rules that I've uh, that I've demonstrated. Uh, let me actually go and delete this component from my model because that might crash the generator. It doesn't expect components with no ports, etc. Um, so here we have our two uh, rules that call these two different templates. I've only shown you this template, component to e class.egl, because it's quite straightforward. If you look at the application to class component and uh, the one that wires up the, all the components, uh, you can see that it's uh, it's a little bit more complicated, right? And I will leave that to you to study uh, in your own time. So I've already generated some code. Uh, so I'll delete this and start uh, start fresh. So if we look at our uh, comps.egx uh, transformation coordination, um, here we put all files under the src folder with uh, the right package name and in a Java file with the appropriate name. So if I was to run my transformation, again, in order to run this, I'll need to go here. So create a new run configuration, add an EMF model to it, 
and select my boiler controller and then I want to read it but not save it and I also want the, the files to be generated not to the current directory not in here but to the root of my of my project where I expect to find the source folder to put file, uh, stuff under so, okay run so now you can see that some java code has popped up here three classes as we'd expect one for the entire application and then two for the two components this class is aha uh, uh, uh -huh. okay so what happens here is it that that uh, parameter types are incorrect and this is because here i made this a boolean while well, it should really be an int. So I run my transformation again and now the error is, uh, is fixed. Now I still have errors here in these two files and this is because they are missing an implementation. So the Java compiler understands that uh, here you're telling me that you're going to return an integer but you return nothing, right? And this is where we need to go in and, uh, and add the implementation of these, two, uh, of these two components. So I will cheat and I have this already here. This is for my boiler actuator. And this is the implementation for my temperature controller, which just returns the difference between the two temperatures. Okay, and if I save everything, you'll see that all errors will disappear. Um, so now I can exercise my code. So I can create a new class uh, called app, where I can have a main method and create so sys out new boiler controller dot execute and I'll say that my current temperature is 20 the target temperature is 25 and the boiler status is off so if I run this code it will tell me that the result is 2 and 2 means turn on uh, turn on the boiler right so the generator did all the hard work of wiring up the components and all I had to do was to implement the local functionality of each component. And as I said, this code might look, uh, uh, might look trivial now, but when you have complex interdependencies between components, when you have a large number of components, uh, getting them in the right order is quite demanding and it, things can go wrong very easily. Implementing a code generator just solves this problem once and then you forget about it. You're confident that uh, even for the most complex models, the sequence in which components will be uh, invoked will be uh, correct. Okay, um, so you will be able to read more about EGL in uh, uh, chapter 7 of the Epsilon book and there's also a section in the articles um, web page on the Epsilon website that has several, uh, several examples of using EGL. Now taking a step back from, from Epsilon, um, there are many more model management languages out there. The object management group that standardizes UML for example um, has uh, standardized also some model management languages such as OCL for model validation, MOF to text, which is similar to EGL, and QVT, uh, standing for Queries, Views, Transformations, which is a, a set of model to model transformation languages. Uh, there are also Eclipse projects such as Axelio, uh, which provides a model to text transformation language, and Expand um, with the same purpose. There are several model-to-model -model transformation languages. We haven't talked about model-to-model -model transformation due to lack of time, but this is another important task in model-driven engineering. 
Um, you will find languages such as ATL and uh, Hensin and, and Viatra, which are actively maintained. Um, and these are only just a few languages to, uh, to mention. Uh, EMF fosters a quite a kind of wide ecosystem of technologies that sit on top of it. Now, if Java is not your thing, and from what we discussed yesterday, it appears that uh, some of you prefer uh, or are familiar with uh, languages such as Python uh, instead of Java, um, there is an implementation of the Eclipse modeling framework in Python. Uh, it's called PyEcore. It's a GitHub project, and you can use PyEcore to create both meta models, models, and then of course to use Python to query models and validate them and generate code and so on and so forth. Perhaps not as conveniently as you would do that in uh, in Epsilon because you have to do everything through plain vanilla Python. There's no equivalent to EGL or EVL or the other kind of more tailored languages, but um, it is it is definitely another option. And I think that brings me to the end of. Uh, uh, of this talk. So just very briefly, we talked about Epsilon, what it is, how it's structured, how the, these the different languages that it contains kind of uh, work uh, on top of each other. And then we talked about uh, EOL, which is the core language of the platform. And then we moved on to EVL for model validation and EGL for model to text uh, transformation.